while you're settling in, we're gently moving on to our second speaker, um, which is um, Dr. Fatima al Badr from Kuwait. Um, Fatima is an assistant professor of international law at Kuwait International Law School. She received her doctorate of law with honors from Emory University Law School in the US. She's published uh, with numerous international journals um, on issues involving women's rights, human rights, counterterrorism, and technology. So a very wide range of expertise, I would say. Um, she additionally did work for numerous international organizations, um, including the UNDP, um, the UN Security Council, and the UN Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearances. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> But still, <laughs> um, so she's also published um, and um, her publications have mostly dealt with the issue of polygamy um, as well as equal citizenship rights for women. And tonight she will focus on the issue of equal citizenship um, for women and men in Kuwait. So please welcome Fatima with a warm round of applause. Okay, thank you everyone. First, I would like to take a moment just to thank the Dutch Ministry of Affairs, thank Lottie and thank Anne-Marie for this wonderful, wonderful event. And I think it's great to be able to get the word out there and be able to fight and advance women's rights in this way. Before I start, I would like to speak a little bit personally, which I don't do in my classroom, but I would like to tell you guys a personal story. So my mother, Fatou Haragam, she actually graduated from America with a master's in aerospace and mechanical engineering at a young age, and we had all traveled to Boston at the time as kids. So it was me, my brother, my mom, and my father at the time. By the time we came back, my mother wanted to really fulfill her passion of completing her PhD in mechanical engineering, but we were all settled in Kuwait at the time, so she decided many, many years later to go back to America in the 2000s to complete her PhD. And when she went to America, it was actually my father who was able to take care of us throughout the time. It was my father who supported us throughout the process. So without my father's support, without the support of her work, without the support of the government, my mother wouldn't have been able to be where she is today. And today, she is actually an advocate for women in the field of engineering. And she has spoken on behalf of women in areas and fields such as the UN Women, conferences such as the UN Women. Me, myself personally, I went to the United States at a young age and I stayed there by myself for 10 years before I went back to Kuwait. And again, without the support of the government that supports many women in Kuwait and without the support of my family, which I really believe that family is a contributing factor for women's rights and women's development in this day and age, I would not be where I am today if not for them. So now I would like to speak a little bit on the history of women's rights in Kuwait. Before 1961, when Kuwait was first founded, women's rights was not new. So what happened at the time, and my leading story that I like to speak about in this sense, is the story of Lulwa al Ghatami. Lulwa al Ghatami in the 1950s was the first woman to study abroad from Kuwait. And at the time, the entire Kuwaiti society did not um, support it. Nobody in society supported it. The only one who truly supported her was her father. And because of her support, he faced many backlash, but she was able to go to America and get a degree in English and in French, and, in French, and she came back and became a school teacher. She continued on the process and she continued to fight for women's rights as a school teacher, leading many protests during the time, all because of her father's support in her. And what happened was while she was a teacher in the high school system, she was able to lead a protest in which, in the past, women were forced to wear the black abayas, so the traditional dresses that women have to wear in the schools. But because of her leading efforts, they no longer have to wear the abayas today. And today, of course, she started a Kuwaiti cultural and social society in which she continues to fight for women's rights today. So in the end, this all goes to show how much family, as well as your culture, can shape women's rights in this field. Finally, so we reach the 1960s and after independence, we took a turn and women started to fight much more for their rights. With the Gulf War, with the Iraqi invasion in 1990, what happened was women continued to fight alongside men in the battlefield. What happened was women were advocating for more rights at the time. What happened was it was women 
who actually struggled in the, in, in the war zone, they were the ones who went out and smuggled in money. They were the ones who went out and smuggled in weapons. And they were the ones who truly had a leading role during the wartime. If men were caught out at the time, they would be questioned by the army or the Iraqi forces. And so that's why it was women who did that. It was women who went to the hospitals and volunteered their time there. And it was women who led protests against the war in Kuwait, leading to, I believe, 89 women dying alongside men as martyrs during the war. So because of their efforts during this wartime, the Kuwaiti government had decided that they would give women more roles after the war, which stands true today. So what happened is you will see that women, the first, um, the first female ambassador in the entire Gulf region came from Kuwait right after the war. They were finally getting executive positions in the war. Eventually, in 2005, you see that they gained the right to vote, but not after significant um, political agendas and debates. After they gained the right to vote, women continued on and on to fight for their rights, and today they or work alongside men as police. They work alongside men as prosecutors. And for the first time in November, we will have our first female judges in November of 2019. But still, even with the amazing advances we have been able to witness in Kuwait, there are still some issues that need work. And I can speak for, uh, on two issues today. One will be about Article 153 of Kuwait's penal code, and the other one on Kuwait's citizenship laws. So first, when it comes to Article 153 of Kuwait's Penal Code, this is the provision that, in essence, allows for honor killings. So it, it still prosecutes them, it still criminalizes honor killings, but what, would, what you see is it goes down from um, federal crimes, or it goes down to federal crime, it goes down, sorry, to a federal crime from, to a misdemeanor. So even though you are still prosecuting the crimes, you are prosecuting them with three years in jail and a 14 Kuwaiti dinar fine. So if a Kuwaiti husband finds his Kuwaiti wife in an adulterous act, or if a Kuwaiti father, a Kuwaiti brother, a Kuwaiti uncle find their unmarried sisters in an act, a sexual act, the crime would go down to a misdemeanor with merely three years in jails and a 14 Kuwaiti dinar fine, which translates, by the way, to 40 euros. So it's not much. Um, and so we still have campaigns dealing with the issue of Article 153 today. We have campaigns called Abolish 153, and their mission is to try to eradicate this Article 153 from Kuwait's penal code. Also, when it comes to Kuwaiti citizenship laws, what you will find is this issue of citizenship when women marry, or when Kuwaiti women marry non-Kuwaiti men, they cannot pass their citizenship on to their children. But the same does not hold true the other way around. So if it is a Kuwaiti father married to a non-Kuwaiti mother, their children will be able to obtain citizenship. But if it's a Kuwaiti mother married to a non-Kuwaiti father, their children will not be able to obtain citizenship, thereby leaving them out of the rights and privileges that Kuwaiti children get if they are born with a Kuwaiti father. And this is due to cultural society and a patriarchal society in which we live in. But you see women fighting for these issues today as well. And they have cited the Constitution to be able to advance their claims. They have cited to the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women to be able to advance their claims. The Constitution specifically states that we cannot discriminate based on sex, race, religion, or origin, but what you will find is that the Kuwaiti nationality law does just that when it discriminates against women's children who, if they take non-Kuwaiti husbands. Additionally, in regards to the Convention on Elimination of Discri Discrimination Against Women, you will see that if you, if you give citizenship to the children of Kuwaiti fathers, you have to give equal citizenship to the children of Kuwaiti mothers. But Kuwait, of course, does have a reservation in that regard. And that reservation states that because this specific provision, Article 9, Paragraph 2 of CEDAW, conflicts with um, Kuwaiti nationality law, they, will, they have an objection to this reservation. Countries such as the Netherlands, Finland, have objected to that reservation, and they have come out and said that it is incompatible with the object and purpose of why we have CEDAW to begin with. But Kuwaiti women have been able to use CEDAW, Kuwaiti women have been able to use the Constitution to be able to further their claims today, and hopefully we will see f further changes in the future. As for what the future holds, I believe that as long as we can continue 
to advocate for women's rights, as long as we can continue to work with local NGOs, work with international NGOs, and raise awareness on the issues, I believe we will continue to see further change in the future. That's it for now. If you have any questions, I guess later. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fatima. <laughs> I remember from my research that um, the citizenship law indeed came up in all my interviews as the single most important issue for, for women, um, that they said that that was for them the most important issue. So it's very interesting to hear this tonight. Um, but also how you pointed out that women are using both um, national instruments of law and international instruments of law to try and improve the situation with respect to the citizenship law.